just everybody there at the wedding is, you know, horrified, right? You know, it's like, you know, except for Tomlin. Tomlin is actually amused because, um, <laughs> you yeah, he's just. The name right. I love it. Tomlin. What? Tommen, I'm sorry, Tom, Tommen. I love it. But, uh, I love Tommen, it. Tommen is not worth remembering. He no, just like no, he's, he, he's just not witty enough. He's he's he he's the only one that's amused by uh, this farce that basically mocks Tyrion and uh, you know just a, 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 who's laughing his ass off. Yeah, a whole bunch of people. Uh, yeah, well, he's and, like, and he's also like nobody finds this funny. Nobody uncharacteristically, uh, funny. Joffrey's like uncharacteristically drunk, right? Because he's yes. like spitting up his wine. Uh, you know, he, he's, you know, he's, he's indulging in, in alcohol more than we've ever seen him in the show, uh, at his wedding. And, you know, it kind of makes sense cause that's, that's when you wouldn't enjoy it. But, um, you know, for the most part, it's the fact that he's just spitting all over himself in joy, uh, watching, um, you know, just, uh, you know, someone dressed up as Renly and someone dressed up as him. And, you know, they're, they're basically, uh, just openly mocking yes. Rob Stark. Uh, to the point know, where they literally Renly, have like, like the, the you know the Stannis. little stuffed mannequins that they're mock riding. You know, Stannis is riding a version of Melisandre. Um, you know, Renly is riding a version of something that's meant to be implied to be Loras. So much so that Loras even Loras just can't even take it and walks right out of the party. And uh, oh man, it just leads to again probably one of the most tense sequences in the entirety of the show, which is insane because again it's another intense sequence where up until the poison there is no blood that is shed because Joffrey tries to get Tyrion to go out and join them, and Tyrion throws it right back at him where he throws it back where he's like, oh, you know, it, it, it wouldn't ju it wouldn't do you know your brave part in the battle of Blackwater Justice. It basically kind of you know mocks him and calls him the calls him out for the coward that he is. Before Joffrey goes over, dumps wine all over his head and forces him to like kind of mock act as his cupbearer. Yeah, what what a response! Like Tyrion goes out of his way and says says he's a coward in you know essentially language that cannot be refuted. Yes. You know, it, it's it's he's not saying anything direct, uh, but everybody there at the wedding understands what is being said. And it's said so elegantly that, you know, it's like the only thing Joffrey can do is childishly walk over and pour wine all over Tyrion. And then uh, uses and then uses power, his remaining power as king, I should say, in order to make Tyrion refill it and act as his cupbearer. And it is yeah, the amount it, of tension that happens between when Tyrion is holding out the wine cup and, he, and Joffrey's trying to get him to kneel. It's like we know obviously that Tyrion didn't didn't poison him, but you would obviously be very forgiving for Tyrion if he did. Yeah, it's like kneel, kneel, and like the the two of them are basically I it was locked. Even Loki from the Avengers, the first Avengers movie, is what it <laughs> sounded like in hindsight. Yeah, so you know the most the the thing is like the two of them are um, at each other's throats. It's only going to be a matter of time. Like this could be it. Right. Like this this could be one of their deaths right here and now at the right. wedding. Uh, or, and if not, so you know if Joffrey wasn't poisoned, you would think like, hey. We're gonna have in an episode or two. We're gonna see some sort of plot uh, that's devastating to one or both of them. Right. Uh, but ultimately, um, you know, he asked for his. You know, um, basically the pie arrives. The pie arrives. This, this is where all the pigeons get murdered, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, and then he picks his wine back up. Back up. Um, and you know, starts to drink it. And then he's like. You know, uncle, coffee. you can't go anywhere, blah, blah, blah. And then that's when uh, his coughing fit well, begins. What's so interesting about how the execution of this scene happens is obviously we know the Tyrion has nothing to do with the actual plot itself. It's all yeah, little that's really and good. Real. And that's yeah. amazingly well done. But what's so interesting, and I remember too when I read this, you know, I remember, again, I remember very, very vividly because the thing that was so shocking to me is I'm like, okay, I knew that Joffrey's wedding and death was going to happen at some point this season, but I thought it was going to be a thing that they like maybe waited until did the midpoint for, uh, you know, like did like for episode five, similar to what they did with Renly's death back in season two. No, the most shocking thing to me, and I still remember this like it was yesterday, is I was down in Florida, my uncle had taken us to Epcot, and I remember, you know, just catching up with the plot summary, you know, because just to see what was going to happen in the episode before I watched that night, and I'm like, wait, 
They did Joffrey's death, wedding and death in the second episode. I was shocked. I was blown away. And so when, upon watching it, like it amazed me even more how they're able to execute that and how they're able to use that as like the jumping off point in order to kickstart the events of this season. But what's even more fascinating about how the scene goes out is it makes me reflect back to the books because the whole interesting thing about it, because it's all sold from Tyrion's perspective, is that in the books, Tyrion and the way that you see his inner monologue as written on the page, it almost makes it seem like he's fully expecting to not walk out of that wedding alive. And, and so, if anything, his actions are almost done from an amount of desperation. So it's like, okay, if I'm not walking out of here alive because he knows that Joffrey has something planned for him, I'm at the very least going to go out with my dignity or what I can in the face of my family. And so it's almost even more shocking with that knowledge when he sees Joffrey start choking, you know? And it's almost like, it's not even a matter of, like, glee. It's almost just a matter of, like, he had such this one idea of what was going to happen in his head that when the reverse happens, he's almost more shocked than we are. And it makes the scene that much more impactful as far as how it's executed because, again, this is a death that we have been waiting for for season after season. This is a character that has done nothing but inflict torture and misery on every single person that he's come into contact with. And so when it does happen, the, the way that they're able to engineer that and make it still seem surprising, it is brilliant. You know, all props yeah, and, and all, 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 yeah, ultimately, Joffrey is the one that brings all the bad to the Lannister clan because if it wasn't for Joffrey and him taking Ned's head off or him torturing Sansa, uh, you know, him just sort of making a mockery of uh, everybody... Uh, even at his wedding, you know, it's like uh, Renly and Loris are made fun of, you know, it's like, it, it's just um, one of those things where like, he just does not care about any tact and having any personal allies and playing the game where it's like, you can't just outwardly attack your opponent because, you know, slighting them and, uh, you know, pu shaming them publicly uh, you know, they have to react, you know, you're forced to actually step up and do something. And so, you know, who knows what Loris would have done? Who knows what, uh, you know, any, you know, anybody else would have done had the wedding just kind of ended, uh, everyone went home and called it a day. Um, but you know, Hey, Olena, you know, basically little finger Academy award caliber performance from her, by the way. Yeah, exactly. They, the, the two of them, you know, orchestrated this whole thing. Uh, they knew from, you know, a season ago, at least, uh, maybe even longer, um, that Joffrey had to go. You know, they saw the writing on the wall, just like everybody else at who attended that wedding. Yeah. Uh, and so the plan was in motion, and they got them right then and there. They were able Indeed. to uh, poison that one. And then the, the creme de la creme, as if watching him slowly realize what was happening on his face, slowly collapse, sputter as they spin him around, his face congesting him, like having vomit as he slowly suffocates in his... The fact that he does it in Cersei's arms, oh, it's, it, it, it's the cherry on top of arguably... I, I know that obviously Ramsay getting eaten by the dogs and at the end of season six is comes close. But yeah, me, it's really good. The, but... af after three seasons worth of just miserable, painstaking awful deaths to all the characters that we were rooting for all the good characters probably the most satisfying death on the entire show yeah and, and, and one of the most jamie's there as well you yes. know so it's it's both his uh you know parents you know the public one and the uh private, private one, one uh basically are there holding their child uh as he dies and you know that's something that everybody actually acknowledges uh is probably true like you know it's an open secret you know it didn't help that ned kind of uh you know, made it apparent to everybody in his letters that he sent across the realm. Um, well, he sent to Stannis, and then that Stannis sent across the realm. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, like, you know, it's the news is out there. Um, you know, and so this is sort West of a, a worst kept secret. Yeah, so it's very poetic that you know the plot ends in that way. Uh, his real parents there holding their child. Um, you know, and and he dies. You know, yes. and. Uh, Cersei, I think, in one of the, the biggest bumbling moves she ever makes, turns around, looks at Tyrion, sort yeah. of like Tyrion's investigating quite the literally cup. literally left holding the cup as Dantos, his little finger's agent, immediately gets Sansa out of there. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, essentially she just accuses him right off the bat. And, you know, it's mainly because she never liked Tyrion. Um, you know, and obviously they had a little spat and now he's dead. Uh, but you know, if, if, you know, and maybe it's just, uh, a, a mother 
enraged and in mourning and, and yeah. suffering um, that just leads her to accuse him openly right then and there. Uh, but ultimately, if you take a logical uh, step back, like um, that's not good. Like, no, you it's basically... not. And if anything, it, it does more as far as setting Tyrion up for helping to destabilize more of the Lannister clan than really any other decision. Like I said, it, it, exactly. It's the same it, to me how so now that Joffrey is out of the way, how Cersei ultimately ends up being even more of the unraveler of her family as we see all the way up until the finale. I will say though, the one other tidbit that I'll add there is that this was this season was Lena Hattie, Lena Hattie's first. Uh, Emmy nomination for the entirety of the show, and I think she more than earned it with this scene alone. Just her kind of the the combination yeah. of like her motherly instincts towards her son, as well as kind of channeling that frustration and anger towards all along with many other just you know ill feelings towards you know towards Tyrion and towards Dinklage. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, Elena, you know, must have like really enjoyed uh, oh, the sure. result of this plot. Like she took a risk, put herself you know out there. Like she could have been caught and imprisoned and killed. Uh, pretty easily if anyone noticed what she did um, with the wine glass. And the fact is... Oh, I didn't even notice until like the fourth time I watched the episode. Yeah, she, she gets away with it. And not only that, but, you know, Cersei's immediately gunning for Tyrion. And it's like, okay, now there's tension within the family. Like, Tyrion, uh, when pushed up against the wall, uh, defended them at the Battle of Blackwater. Like, yep. he, he was a Lannister. And he made... Uh, the right moves and protected the family and made them a strong unit. And immediately Joffrey's death and just the way it happened so publicly with this whole back and forth bitter between Tyrion and Joffrey, it, it just leads to a fracturing of family members. And um, unfortunately that, that little chip uh, at their structure is what allows um for the unravelment of their family. Yeah, it, yeah it, like exactly. I said, I talked a lot about Tywin's fatal flaw, but this is the beginning. Like I said, we don't get as much of it with Cersei. We get much more of it in the next two seasons, like as far as far as kind of the characters that we follow throughout this middle act of Game of Thrones, but it shows Cersei as we get to know her more as a character and we get more of her backstory shows that her ultimate fatal flaw is the fact that she is always going to prioritize her and those closest to her's personal safety over kind of the, you know, what 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 the smarter moves are as we see here. You know, and so that's it. That is our recap of the line of the rose. In hindsight, I still don't. And know the poison, anymore. don't forget and that. And the poison, of course, can't forget that. I, I personally do still think that this is one of the best episodes of the entire show. I love how it's structured. I love how the tension is so throughout it. It results in probably the most satisfying death on the entire show of one of the most hated characters in all of television. Uh, this was obviously Jack Leeson's last performance of the show, and I will say that even though his character was despicable, he did a fantastic job portraying him for the three. Well, his uh, save. Sadism will live on with Ramsey. We saw Indeed. the passing of the torch, you know, in the beginning of the episode uh, with them chasing uh, this poor woman down in the woods. Yes. And also uh, RIP to Tansy, who Ramsey brutally had his hounds murder and the three people that Melisandre burned on Dragonstone. Again, we're still keeping the death count going, people. We're well, a little bit. Yeah, going. we kind of fallen off the uh, the boat. It here, happened. But, we haven't uh, had as many main we'll character deaths, real. That's the problem. We had, we had like a little bit of a dry spell up until the Red Wedding happened last season. But this season, we're going to see a lot more bodies drop the, hit the floor. So yeah, that was hey, it. That listen, was last episode, the hound got those chickens and, and yes, got rid of a he bunch of... Lannister men like yeah, that was a pretty brutal fight wedding. sequence. You, you, you gotta think. Yeah. You gotta you gotta think what's going on in Tywin's head. Where it's like, man, what a bitch! I literally just went out of my way, ain't life a bitch. Where I just went out of my way to engineer this whole wedding in order to take out the Starks, and now we got my prize grandson and heir being taken out at his own goddamn wedding. Obviously, in hindsight, you know it kind of works out more for him because Tom is definitely a lot easier to control than Joffrey. But still, you know, it just it, it, <laughs> oh, well, yeah, all until uh, you know, I, until uh, oh my god. Shot. Oh my God! I have a crossbow sticking one... out of me while I'm on the toilet. Oh my God! He jumped out a window. Oh no, that's Tywin. But uh, I'm talking about the uh, <laughs> young kid who's like, "Oh my beautiful bride, uh, I could have any other woman in the realm, uh, <laughs> but the one, the one beautiful bride that actually talked to me, uh, because no, no one in the family talks no, to me, and I'm like alone. Like, no, listen, like everyone treats him like a kid. Uh, they don't really allow him to have a personal opinion." Uh, he's isolated. He's trapped. Marjorie, you know, is, you know, does what she always does. You know, uh, she sees a hole in the marketplace and then goes <laughs> to fill it. And the fact that, well, it, look, you know, King's Landing, they all hated Joffrey uh, because he brutalized, you know, not only, uh, you know, Ned Stark and the Stark family, but he brutalized the people of King's Landing. Like, he just didn't 
you know, treat them as if they were people. He, he disrespected them. So Marjorie came in, uh, she set up these charitable programs and really won the love of the people. And she does the same thing, um, you know, with this new, uh, you know, uh, basically, uh, marriage that she has to, she, how many marriages is she going to have by the way? Oh, but, man. uh, uh, essentially, uh, she goes in there and realizes that he's just alone. He's kept isolated. He's controlled. And, you know, he, uh, she basically makes him feel comfortable, uh, talking with her, uh, you know, giving out his opinion. What's going on guys? Dom the Movie Nerd of Talking TV here. And if you like this video, make sure you click the subscribe button and the like button and leave a comment down below. Make sure you keep tuning in for new episodes, which we have going live every Sunday. That's right. Every Sunday at 11 a.m. And as always, remember to always watch more fucking movies. Mm -hmm.